Right. Hello, everybody. I get the honor of doing the introductions today. Um, so it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Carles Bosch from the Francis Crick Institute. He is studying the science of, um, of smell um, and the logic behind the neural circuits of smell. He's a principal research a laboratory scientist with a background in um, biotechnology, neuroscience and biomedicine. And he has been using an array of imaging techniques to um, target specific regions in the brain um, to explore the ultra structural precision while keeping the big picture in context. And it's really exciting to uh, be able to see um, all the different things he's been combining. And um, I'm looking forward to your talk, Carlos. So please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. Uh, for the nice intro, um, and thank you very much, all the organizers, for the for the invitation uh, to to give a talk um, in this in this series. Oops, I'll try to minimize this. Cannot. There we go. So yeah, um, I'm glad to be here today. I'll be talking about an approach that we've uh, developed in the lab that works pretty well, I would say, for the purposes that we are. We're using it at the moment. Um, it has been mainly the, the piece of work that's been released this year in the form of two uh, research papers. I'll be showing you at the end in case you have more interest, you can follow up and definitely get in touch with us. Um, and it's about how to study mammalian neuronal circuits, um, which are things that by nature, they're large, they contain things that are far away from each other, with important details that are small and that on top of that contain a temporal domain that is relevant. Um, there we go. So what we want to understand is how the brain works. However, the human brain uh, contains many challenges embedded to it, nonetheless one of them being the size of it. Um, so making the challenge simpler, it can also involve a start focusing on one, but one solution that is um, uh, smaller, such as the mouse brain, and within it, the one circuit that is particularly interesting that makes even simpler to study um, how the brain does the things it does, um, which is olfactory bulb. This circuit contains the first synapse in the processing of odors as the, the signal comes from the nose. And it, what it makes it also very much interesting is that if we look at a cross coronal section of it, we observe a quite regular pattern, driven, uh, mainly driven by the fact that the circuit is modular. So altogether is compact, what we could call a circuit, meaning something that has an input and has an output, can be well contained within a cubic millimeter. But on top of that, it's surrounded by replicas with a slightly different tuning, slightly different properties, which makes it relatively simple um, to study how diverse a particular circuit can be um, with the techniques that one may have in hand. And just as a quick overview of how the circuit works, and here are these very, very simplistic diagram of it, the input is what I label here in those thin uh, layers would be the sensory axon, the axons of the sensory neurons that would detect odorants in the nose. So they would send their input to the olfactory bulb, and they are of the same color, representing what happens in reality, which is that the neurons sensing with the same receptor, and there's only one receptor per neuron, um, one receptor type per neuron, uh, bundle together and innervate and build up one massive input structure in the olfactory bulb that we call glomerulus. And by massive, I mean more than 100 microns wide. Then within the olfactory ball, within those two, 300 microns, something very interesting happens, which is the projection neurons listen to one particular glomerulus with one affiliated apical dendrite that is thick, five microns thick, relatively straight, and only goes to one glomerulus. And every glomerulus in the mouse will have a bunch of those associated projection neurons, associated mitral cells, let's call it 10. Then those mitral cells actually scattered um, in terms of the cell bodies in this monolayer that is two, three microns, 300 microns away, send their own accent, project the information they have sensed to other places in the brain. And that's 
from the input to the output, how the olfactory bulb mainly drive the excitatory connectivity. Now, we can study this circuit in many ways, but the moment we want to image it, actually we would like to do two main things from it, right? We would like to understand how different neurons get tuned to different stimuli, and then understand as well how those neurons are wired together. And I'll be using a diagram like this one to map out the different data sets that may come from those imaging techniques. In this diagram, in the x-axis, you can see that there's the grain size, the voxel size of those data sets that we would want. And in the y-axis is the volume we would have to image um, in order to contain the full data set that would make sense, right? So for the glomerulus of the mouse olfactory bulb, there's a couple of data sets that would be super interesting to, to look at. And interestingly enough, all of them happen to be in a region that is experimentally visible. This is around a terabyte in the order of magnitude of a terabyte in size each. So we could ask for the connectome within every single glomerulus, which would be this data set here. Or we could aim for establishing the input-output relationships for all the neurons in a glomerular column, which would be this column dendrite box in here. The data set would live in this region, so roughly a cubic millimeter at a voxel size that could reliably resolve all the five micron thick dendrites. Or we could aim for the same for the hundreds of glomerular columns that would sit in the dorsal uh, section of the olfactory bulb, which would be this one here. The volume in this case would be slightly larger, but the resolution, again, could be even coarser if we only want not all the dendrites, but only the apical ones. When we want to do those experiments, then we need to overlay our desires with the capacity we can, we can have. And here I'm mapping out what different imaging techniques can provide um, and their comfort zones. And the different imaging techniques are color coded based on the illumination that, um, that generates them. In blue, I'm, color, I'm, I'm showing a line microscopy approaches, just um, a two photon microscopy, multi photon. In yellow, X ray techniques that um, X ray imaging techniques, and in purple, electron microscopy. So, for instance, if we start our experiment doing in vivo imaging of a glomerular plane, like in this diagram here with a mouse anesthetized, but presenting others of different nature, up to 50 with it, or 48 actually, in this particular experiment, while we image that glomerular plane with two photon imaging at the layer that here I'm showing in, in red, we would see a map of this kind. And this approach could already tell us, as we see different places that are flashing, how different circuits or neurons are preferably activated by certain stimuli. And while this data set in terms of field of view of voxel sizes would live in this place, then we could acquire another data set with serial block phase electron microscopy at a permissive resolution, 100 nanometer voxel sizes, let's call it, um, but large enough within a cubic millimeter or nearby to contain the entire glomerular column. So we could trace all the apical and dendrites and relate all the projection neurons to the power and glomerular. So it seems that here the job would be done, but actually there's one ingredient that is missing, which is linking the two data sets together. Until we do that, there is no way we can assign any of the activity that we have sensed from the in vivo experiment to the wiring properties that we can obtain from the electron microscope. In order to do that, to relate the, the information from different imaging modalities within the same specimen is what we call an approach um, for correlative multimodal imaging. And those approaches can be represented in many ways. And, and in, in a sort, we have conceptualized it as well in this flowchart diagram, where you would start with a source of tissue, be that a live mouse, and you would um, submit that uh, specimen to different imaging techniques. And before every imaging technique, necessarily you will have to process that sample so it becomes suitable to it. At the end, every imaging technique will provide you one data set that once curated, you can try to correlate especially with other data sets. And here that step is shown in blue. The moment you do that, 
it means that you would be able to navigate through this discontinued line. So this is how this actual experiment looked like at the end. It was not just two techniques, that the ones that allowed us to cross the path between vivo to photon to EM, but actually something more like seven altogether. And uh, what I will do today is to walk you through what allowed us to develop this particular experiment. And I would like to also give some insights on the, the future or the profit one can obtain with such approaches. So first, I will talk about one technique that was essential or that is even um, um, giving more promising results as we keep working on it, which is synchrotron X-ray uh, tomography. And then I will talk about how do we warp data sets together? How do we establish that correlation once we have the data sets? So let's start by the first part and talk a bit about synchrotron X-ray computed tomography with propagation-based phase contrast, which um, we usually uh, abbreviate as SXRT. This is an X-ray imaging technique. The source, the, uh, the illumination, are coherent X-rays, like the ones we, we can usually find at synchrotron facilities. Here depicted is the one that we have um, uh, near Oxford, um, the, um, the diamond light source. And in particular, in the box part, uh, you can see the length of the I-13-2 beamline, the one that we have used for this particular purpose. So in that case, what you get is a, is a beam of X-rays, partially coherent, that will, um, that will um, um, find your sample. Your sample will interact with the beam. The form will absorb part of it. It will scatter some of those X-rays as well. And you will detect that trans, uh, transmitted beam with a scintillator and a couple to, uh, couple to it an optical system that will generate a projection image. Later on, you can rotate your sample and repeat the operation until you get a tomogram. The reconstruction of those tomograms is what will give you a 3X, 3D XYZ data set of your specimen that in this particular technique then will have um, um, been formed by the information retrieved not only from the absorption, but also a tiny bit as well from the uh, scattering that occurred during the interaction of the beam with the sample. Now, because both absorption and scattering are properties that scale up with the atomic number of an element, it is not surprising that samples that have been stained, soft tissue samples that have been stained with heavy metals and embedded in resin work well with X-rays, notably because they have preserved uh, ultrastructure when we process them in the same way uh, and the same care as we usually do for electron microscopy. For those specimens that we bring, and typically, as you can tell, the data that the specimens themselves are quite large, three by three by 0.6 millimeters in this case, we obtain single tomograms um, that were very useful for us. Every tomogram spanning around a cube, covering cubes that would be around 700 microns in size. However, in size uh, with height and length. However, what is most interesting is that the sample is not destroyed by this process. And so we can follow up every tomogram with another one and effectively tile the entire dimensions of the sample and then stitch the different tiles together. So while every single tomogram takes typically in third generation synchrotrons around 20 minutes to be generated, the altogether the stitch 24 tom tomogram tiling takes in the order of seven hours to generate this, this data set that expands around nine cubic millimeters um, and con can contain around, in our case, around four or five cubic millimeters of tissue. Now, what can be seen in this data set? Well, we use this um, relatively unbiased um, uh, measure for resolution of a, a data set called Fourier shell correlation. And we employed that with the same data set at two different beam lines and also with different imaging reconstruction paradigms to, uh, to see the ballpark where things could live. And we saw that pretty much all the time we could reliably obtain a resolution near the single migrant, um, depending on the conditions and the resolution criteria. And that, taking into account the vast size that is being resolved with these techniques, 
is quite useful for biology, namely because it allows us to resolve features that are interesting for us. If we look in the olfactory bulb, we can observe here in the bottom layer and compare it to a common um, um, compact light source system that can be obtained um, uh, commercially and that is extremely useful for many reasons. And we observe that there is an edge that is obtained with a synchrotron um, X-ray modality, like the texture that we get, can already at this level observe inside the glomeruli, like the well definition of all the nuclei, um, be that projection neurons, as well as the smaller nuclei from granule cells. And looking at this coronal section, or sagittal section, that we observe in the middle plane, we even see those tiny white stretches of dendrite. Also importantly, as I mentioned, this is a non-destructive technique, which means that after the, you, you get the data set, you still have your sample. Um, for this epoxy resin embedded samples, the near 1 million grays of radiation that were deposited on the sample during the uh, imaging of this lab didn't produce any appreciable damage uh, when we check for uh, ultrastructural um, state using electron microscopy. Here below, I'm highlighting some axon bundles in the olfactory nerve layer, but you can also see finer features like uh, Golgi apparati or some synapses around. So that got us confident. The ultrastructure of the tissues is still preserved, and therefore, this type of study is perfectly compatible with follow up studies and aiming for higher resolution or targeted regions if desired. And one last thing we wanted to check is for the things that we resolve, how well could we do that? And we checked one particular feature, which is apical dendrites of apical of projection neurons and olfactory bulb, again, the system that we are most uh, interested in studying. Um, and as I mentioned before, apical neurons are very interesting because they link the input, the glomeruli, with the output, the mitocells of the olfactory bulb. So would we, we obtained the exact same location after doing synchrotron X-ray with the electron microscopy with serial block phase EM. And in doing so, we could trace the same apical dendrite with both modalities independently and check how well we, were, we could trust the X-ray tracings. What we observe is that we could trust those tracings of apical dendrites for around 200 microns. Again, a very interesting mark because it is the, in the ballpark of the distance between the mitocell layer and the glomerular layer, the input and output, suggesting that in those data sets, the input-output relationships can be obtained for a decent fraction of neurons across vast, um, vast regions of tissue. So now I've talked to you about this uh, particular imaging modality, synchrotron X-ray tomography. I would like to talk to you about the second part um, that we also found very um, crucial when designing those, um, um, those approaches, which is how do we get the maps together? How do we overlay the correlated maps in, of, obtained from the same sample? So at some point in those experiments, we'll end up in a situation where we have two data sets obtained from the same specimen, but with different um, imaging modalities. That means that the different data sets while they report properties of the same space, they do so with a slightly different voxel sizes, covering a slightly different volumes, and probably as well with a slightly different orientations. However, we can manage to do the experiment in a way that conserved landmarks can be identified in both, for instance, blood vessels. And if we are able to pair those landmarks between different data sets, means that finding the exact same location, X, Y, Z, that corresponds to another location in the other data set, we can ultimately generate a warping field that allows us to squeeze, to warp one data set onto the other, onto the other data set's geometry. And the nature of those landmarks will depend on the two data sets that we are warping. So for instance, when we are translating warping from lab to synchrotron X-ray tomography, or from synchrotron X-ray tomography to electron microscopy, the amount of, uh, of, of landmarks is quite reduced. And the, and, uh, the, the types of, the, the amount of things that can serve as landmarks is immense because the, uh, the imaging techniques are quite similar in terms of contrast generation. So pretty much everything is a conserved landmark. However, when it comes to structural 
um, modalities than the structural modalities and fluorescent imaging techniques that only reve reveal part of the underlying nature based on the reporter, uh, the reporter agent that we're using. In that case, we need to be careful on what is the bad set of landmarks, of concerned landmarks that we are using every time. In this case, both histological um, parameters like the borders of, of, um, of the brain, or as well as um, blood vessels, as we kind of uh, observe um, here in the electron microscopy, were very useful to correlating those, those data sets. And once we have that warp field defined, the first thing we can do is to warp the entire data set and overlay the different imaging modalities onto one another. In that way, we can see the same region of the brain in this case through different techniques and um, relate the, how the different features would change their contrast um, based on the, on the eyes that we are looking through. However, we can do something else. Once we have that warping function, we can simply warp an annotation. This is the locations of things we might be interested in. For instance, a couple of cells um, describing a constellation that uh, um, can be very well visible in one case, while in the other case, we might not know of the existence of those cells, but maybe the presence of all cells. If we are able to translate only the positions of those cells, the, of those cells of interest, first computation is much cheaper. It's in this case just moving the x, y, z coordinates of seven dots, but also it offers a handle to treat that computationally and assess how well, how accurate are we actually doing that job. And when the feature to translate becomes blood vessels, we use that as a tool to measure tracing accuracy. So here we trace blood vessels in the same ge geographic region of the three data sets, the two photon, the synchrotron, and the electron microscopy uh, data set, and warp them to a common space. Then we identify nodes in those blood vessels that were unique, um, namely, for instance, the branching, the branching points that can, are unequivocal, here represented by Xs and interpolated a, a large number of nodes between those points. So we could actually pair locations across data sets. By measuring the distance between those paired locations, we would then get a, an insight on the accuracy on how that working, warping had happened. And the part that interest, interest, interested us the most was that we could then map that distance across the entire landscape of the of the data set because we had the thought that different imaging techniques may not perform as well across the sample some may give you better signal to noise on the surface of the tissue and poorer at the bottom and that could also relate that some of the landmarks that you're using for warping become also either poorer or less abundant in some places or, or others so doing this approach allowed us to actually map the accuracy of the warping throughout the data set and so here, what we see is a color code of the distance between the blood vessels worked in pairs of modalities between two photon and synchrotron and between two photon and EM. The first thing we see is that the color coding scale, the top it can go is not that bad uh, in terms of uh, uh, tissue biologists. It's um, worst case uh, closer to the 30 micron range, uh, not, not beyond that. But most interesting is if we check for the average results across the entire, the entire experiment, the accuracy we were obtaining was on average always below the diameter of a single uh, cell when warping from in vivo uh, to photon to either of the structural modalities, either EM or synchrotron X-ray. And that has a particular strategic value on its own because it means that the cells that we have imaged in vivo we can find them directly on the synchrotron data set. And as I mentioned before, that is a non-destructive technique that allows, allows us to process relatively large uh, sizes of tissue in the size of the, in, the, in the range of multiple cubic millimeters. So that means that we can do two photon, then synchrotron X-ray, and find with a, that, with a very decent confidence the locations of all the neurons that have been acquired in vivo 
and that will have several uses later on, both in terms of obtaining information in the synchrotron data set alone, as well as to serve as a very good guide to, to, to do the trimming of that sample for follow-up imaging techniques that may give you better resolution, but come at the cost of not being able to handle such a big specimen to start with. The last point that I want to bring is that doing this kind of experiments means that you are committing quite a bit to particular data sets in terms of their coordinates. And that um, unfortunate mistakes, which could be the, the re-slicing or changing the voxel sizes of a particular data set or another can become uh, quite detrimental to the performance of this long uh, process. These and other, uh, another caveat made it very interesting made it very interesting to uh, relay on a data set management uh, system that allows three main things. First, that the library of data sets is hosted on a server, uh, which makes it robust. Um, that the exploration of the data set happens through a browser and that it is possible to both explore as well as to annotate in a multi-user simultaneous way. We work with one solution that offers those three things. There's probably others um, called WebNosos. WebNosos was first developed open source um, uh, from the Max Planck uh, Institute for Brain Research, now further developed and maintained by Scalable Minds. And we've been in close collaboration with that team for quite a while. And through this work, we also enabled all this warping um, toolbox functionality uh, throughout this uh, repo that is available for anyone else to use. And you feel free to visit it um, to integrate that functionality for yourself or simply to explore the different data sets that we employed in that study, which are also open access. So altogether, I hope I convinced you that in order to go from in vivo to electron microscopy, one can do it in one go, but it's quite interesting. It's quite interesting to, to do this uh, middle step going for synchrotron X-ray tomography. We will be able to image larger pieces of tissue at sub, at, uh, and, and give us subcellular resolution um, and, and be able to extract insights from it. And on top of that, we'll be able to relate the positions that we've recorded in vivo at single cell precision in the synchrotron data set. So now um, this kind of approach is already useful for going from VO to EM for this massive systems neuroscience um, common endeavor, I would say, to, to, many, to many initiatives, but it holds other values on its own. And the different dualities I think are worth appreciating. Um, they are given uh, different names. In our case, we termed it in terms of using it as a bridge and using it as a context tool. And I'll give you some examples that will illustrate those two uses of, um, of the synchrotron techniques combined with, uh, with, um, with, within a correlative multimodal imaging between in vivo and in So first, let's talk about the bridge. And both lab and synchrotron X-rays can serve as such. Um, a bridge means that they can help us go between imaging modalities and target the region that we want to acquire at high precision. So for instance, here we started with a, a glomeruli in that were expressing a GFP um, based on the specific receptor of those um, olfactory sensory neurons. Um, so we have two genetically identified glomeruli in this tissue that we want to obtain an electron microscopy uh, data set um, on, on them. So here, X-ray microscopy allowed us on several iterations to run through the trimming of that data set to consistently verify that the region of interest was still in sight until we made it small enough it could enter the electron microscope. And even then, it helped us determine the exact location of the field of view um, that we should target with a serial block phase, which only gives us an insight of the surface of the tissue, so it would effectively contain the full glomerular column in both cases. However, the synchrotron data set contains detail on its own that is relevant for biology because it's in the subcellular regime. And it's also because of the large field of view that is available, the landscape, the combination of detail and landscape makes it 
particularly inter uh, it makes it interesting for for context uh, issues. For instance, here I'm depicting several features that can be observed in different brain regions, bundle axon bundles in the striatum cells, and also apical dendrites in the neocortex and um, Purkinje cell bodies in the cerebellum, for instance. And I would say that we explored all those different brain regions. We are mostly interested in olfactory bulb in order to widen the interest to the wider neuroscience community. But this should also serve as an example that those kind of data sets can not only be obtained for brain samples, but for any uh, soft tissue sample, be that lung or heart, um, to name a few. So it, it is predicted that cell bodies and, um, and uh, fibrous tissue agglomerations should of within those uh, sizes and ranges should have enough intrinsic contrast um, to be uh, resolved as well in those cases. And so this, this technique be relevant for those. But there's one particular benefit um, when we use X-rays in combination with electron microscopy, which is that on top of that near micron context across several cubic millimeters, we can also obtain uh, ultrastructural context at a narrower region. And therefore, it is particularly interesting to answer biological questions that are determined by that duality of features, local features at the ultrastructural scale with larger features uh, within a further than 100 micron distance. And here I'm going to depict one particular usage that we did of this uh, correlative pipeline to resolve a question in the hippocampus, a well-studied region um, responsible for the storage of new memories and spatial navigation in the mouse. Um, in a previous study, um, it was reported that some cells in the hippocampus had different synaptic signatures, different structures for wiring um, in, in some part. And there's some nuance that uh, it was super interesting that they, they brought. And one is that the CA1 region, it should be thought as to having two additional subregions or three, but two other ones that were studied here, A and C. And each of those subregions receives input preferentially from slightly different uh, zones in the brain as well, meaning that they may have uh, different, uh, um, different functions. And finally, also that the neurons, the projection neurons of the hippocampus the CA, uh, in the CA1, they were classified between deep and superficial depending on the position of the cell body in the CA1 layer. And that has also um, other, other correlates based on developmental origin and as well as function elsewhere. So while the, what they observed was that in the distal part of that dendritic tree, the neurons in the CA1, A, uh, had more input contacts, more than dendritic spines, uh, if they superficial than if they were deep. And that was uh, an exciting finding to, to observe. What was striking, however, was that when they looked at the region that is right closer from they initially uh, explored, the stratum dendritium, um, they did not find any difference in the amount of dendritic spines, in the amount of synaptic input synaptic context those neurons would be receiving. And that was a bit striking because, well, if, if it was well defined that those two neighboring neurons were slightly different types um, that had a consistent input phenotype, input structure difference in their distal part, why they would not have any in their more, more proximal region? Could it be because the, result, the resulting power of the technique being used at the moment of the study could simply not discern it, uh, could some, simply not resolve the, the, the difference? And if so, could it be that could we find any uh, feature that is thin, finer in structure than the presence or absence of dendritic spines uh, that could tell us something about that structural difference between those neuron cell types. And the simplest one we could think of is the presence or absence of spine apparatus, uh, an organelle that is well known for um, their function as a calcium, calcium buffer, and also their motility and presence uh, on dendritic spines based on the activity um, features. So it could well be that um, the, the, the different maturation states or different input properties of the spines could relate with the presence or absence 
as a population of that uh, spine apparatus. So that definitely called for a correlated a correlative approach in which we um, did synchrotron X-ray tomography of a large hippocampal region containing the CA1A, and then serial block phase EM of a narrower region, and in particular at high resolution in the stratum radiator. In the synchrotron data set, we trace the apical dendrites of all the pyramidal neurons, which we color coded and categorized based on their depth in the in the CA1 pyramidal, um, uh, pyramidal layer. And when those apical dendrites crossed and entered the high resolution EM region, warping the two annotations together, we could identify the features across data sets. Then we trace in the EM data set all those dendritic trees in detail. In particular, annotating the presence of dendritic spines and adding tags when those spines contain a spine apparatus. As a result, the EM data set look, the annotation of the EM data set looks something like this, where cells color coded based on, on their depth had dendrites um, with plenty of small protrusions of dendritic spines, and some of them having um, a spine apparatus inside, an organelle of this type. When we check for the density of spine apparatuses in those dendrites, we observe that indeed CA1A radiating um, superficial pyramidal neurons had also a larger density of spine apparatus, even if they did not have more than dendritic spines as the previous uh, study had reported. So we also um, did another analysis in which correlating the different data sets together gave us some extra insight, maybe a bit more methodological on how those different workflows can uh, should occur. And it is that at the end, you want to match the features you have observed in the different imaging modalities. So from in vivo to electron microscopy, you can start assigning features from the in vivo data set, and then um, you will have to figure out how many of these can you actually recall later on. Again, being able to translate the, the data sets to a common um, to a common framework, we could put onto a sim single coordinate space the location of the glomeruli that had been imaged in vivo, the location of all glomeruli that could be identified in electron microscopy, and then crossing both, we could give the genetic identity to the glomerulus here shown in red that had a specific gene expressed. And also interestingly, could, it helped us identify three glomeruli that had previous, uh, initially identified in vivo as such, and then the electron microscopy data set told us that they were not so. Um, again, this being able to have both data sets in one place in a correlative, micro, um, correlative multimodal imaging approach allows, allows you to have this added benefit of quality controlling for your results and probably in many cases explaining in this way for um, uh, unexpected artifactual um, 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 uh, readouts. So altogether, I hope I have convinced you that such a correlative multimodal approach can be useful for studying mammalian uh, neuronal circuits from a, a functional and structural perspective. Um, in particular, that synchrotron X-ray tomography can provide near micron context across larger than 100 micron landscapes. That two photon and synchrotron X-rays can be warped and signal cell accuracy. That this workflow um, is applicable to other biological soft tissue systems. Um, not necessarily limited to the brain, and that is also compatible with other X-ray modalities, as well as other electron microscopy uh, modalities, I might say. And with this, I would like to dedicate one minute to this most important slide. First mentioned that this, this uh, what I've been presenting today, is uh, a piece of work that has been released this year in the form of two papers. Have, uh, feel free to browse through them and get in touch um, if there's anything uh, you might know more about. Um, the, all the data sets uh, shown are freely available on, through this uh, repo, and there's a bit more insight you can get, but also um, there's the toolbox that we are using for annotating, um, integrating big warps, um, 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 warping tool with web no source a skeleton system. And last but not least, a big thanks to all the collaborators that have made this um, this project possible and keeps uh, uh, rolling in, in many cases. Um, big shout out to Tobias and Yushin, uh, postdoc and PhD student at the, at the same lab uh, where I am with whom we've developed uh, this workflow. 
Um, Tobias was the um, early, um, he has been maintaining the and, and running the two photon microscope and collaborating hand by hand. Yushin, she's uh, doing a brilliant PhD um, in pushing the boundaries of, of this uh, workflow even further. Um, at the right hand side, Manuel and Norman, uh, developers of WebNosos, with uh, again, extremely helpful integrating all the different tools together and making sure that we we don't stuck with uh, any of the any of the bugs that uh, may occur. And at the top row, um, all the synchrotron uh, X-ray physicists we we have collaborated for this particular uh, project. Probably many more, and, and I, I didn't have space or, or to to put them in the screen. But yeah, thank you very much to all the teams that uh, have been uh, crucial for this study. And with this, I will finish up and uh, be happy to receive any questions. Thank you very much, Carlos. That was really uh, exciting. Um, and um, I guess now we move to the Mentimeter quiz. Is Nick oh, able to take over? And if anybody wants to write any questions in the chat during this, please go ahead. Yep, I've got the quiz set up, ready to go. I think we need a few more people to join us, but um, let's see. Right, can you see that? Yes. Right, good. I think that's uh, is that the hippocampus. <laughs> in, uh, I think, let's see, I've got, according to my little thing, there's three people online. Let's see if we can get a few more people to join in with the quiz before we go off. And um, while we're waiting, oh, here we go, some more people joining. Um, feel free to come up with questions in um, and put them in the chat. We'll get to them after the quiz. Oh, okay. This is a good opportunity to win a Christmas present for oh. somebody. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> All right. Shall we get going? Well, wish me luck as usual. All right. Okay, yeah, we've got a good few players, so let's... Uh, Let's get going. Question one is coming up and quick on the buzzers, please. SRXT of metal stained samples can resolve uh, apical dendrites of projection neurons, individual cell nuclei, blood vessels, clusters of fibrous tissues as larger than 10 microns, or all of the above. And the answer is all of the above. Right. Let's see, who's, uh, let's see who's fastest on that one. Uh, ooh, Sebastian is fastest with Crop and Barefoot Contessa close on your heels. Right, next question. And here we go. SRXT can, SXRT can be useful for Bridging imaging techniques across scales, providing contextual information about the size and distribution of biologically relevant features across space or all of the above. And the answer is all of the above. Okay, right. I think this is gonna be quite competitive today. Who's the winner? Both, both faces on the go in it today. Croc is now winning with Fly and Mr. Spaceman up there. Ah, Barefoot Contessa, you've, you've fallen behind a bit there. Um, all right. Next question. <laughs> Thanks for making these up, actually. Imaging with SRX. SXRT, a three by three by 0.6 cubic millimeter mouse brain slab with, ah, <laughs> there we go, the curse of Mentimeter. Oh, no, we got some answers. I, 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 can, I can't even read them out now because uh, it's, it's lagging at my end. Anyway, one hour to 10, 10 hours is uh, the answer for that question. And five people got that one right. So uh, it's anybody's guess where we are now. 
Oh. Oh, Martin, are you seem you might have you got the winner. Let's see. Oh, Mr. Spaceman is now winning with Martin and Chris and Catherine <laughs> right behind you. Okay. Question four. All right, this one is very long. So uh, correlative ethics, RT and SBM is particularly useful for understanding phenomena in biological soft tissues encoded by, you're going to have to get reading very quickly, sub-micron detail with 100 micron cube volume, um, and sub-micron detail up to, I, I, ooh. Ooh, 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 two people got that one, because <laughs> I could read the answers out. Okay, so I think we might have got a change of leadership here, let's have a look. Oh, no, Mr. Spaceman is doing it again, Martin. You are very close again. So, uh, Mr. Spaceman and Martin, you've consolidated the lead. Let's see if those two can uh, beat each other. Right. I put the I put the uh, much quicker question in at number five. So this one is really about speed here. And last question. SXRT imaging is a destructive te technique or is a non-destructive technique, which is right. Hopefully you've got that, that message loud and clear during the talk. <laughs> it's a non-destructive technique, right. So let's see if we can uh, reveal the winner. Ah, Ooh. a lot of very quick people there. Martin, you are <laughs> this week's winner. You just picked uh, uh, Chris and Catherine and Mr. Spaceman. So if you could make yourself, uh, identify yourself to the uh, organizers in the chat or by the message, the uh, fold scope will be winning its way to you. With that, I'll stop sharing. Let's get over to questions. Right. Is anyone posting questions or does anyone want to put their hand up? Oh, here we go. Alessandro, would you like to unmute yourself and um, ask your question in person? So colors you could you can unmute as well. Uh, hello, I can speak if you want. Yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? Okay, you can hear me. Yeah. Um, no, thank you for the talk, Carl. Um, I was just curious about the alignment between the volumes, so how it's made. If it's, I suppose there is a manual step and then automatic, or is all just put the data in and uh, which software is used? How, how, how is easy and long to do this alignment? Sure. Thanks. Um, hi, Alessandro. So, yeah, the nice, que nice question. So, as I mentioned, um, the adding um, adding the landmarks um, probably didn't mention it explicitly. I cited uh, John's um, paper in the slide. Um, we use Big Warp, Fiji Big Warp, as the tool to um, identify landmarks, land them together, and see how when is good enough. And I say that because it's a really cool tool. It it is performs pretty well uh, with data sets that can be closed or even sometimes if I remember correctly um, beyond even the RAM capacity of your local computer but importantly it updates the warping as you go meaning with you will start with at least you need four nodes right four con corners you need to define a tetrahedron tetrahedron somehow in your data set but once you've identified four landmarks in the two data sets you can apply the transform See how it goes. See how it overlays, and then keep up the keep adding landmarks and updating the the warping solution. Um, so for that, I can only recommend uh, wholeheartedly uh, Big Warp. It works very well. What I insisted is that you can use that in two ways. You can either align, as you say, your data set, and that means exporting from Big Warp. Say I export the warp data set into the target field of view, but you can also just save the landmarks. I mean. In the warp annotations workflow, what we do is to save the landmarks and then use them offline on MATLAB. Uh, 
to transform the annotations, to warp the annotations between the paired data sets. For that, in principle, very similar approach, but at the end, um, a slightly different one in terms of data, how to operate it. That's when the, the, the warp annotations toolbox comes, comes into play. But big warp, if you want to align data sets, big warp can do the whole job for you. Right. Um, got another question from Dan Gunton. Do you want to um, unmute and ask yourself, Dan? There we go. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Dan. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the two photo and imaging. Um, it seemed like the, the vasculature, like the blood vessels and things was the main sort of landmark you were kind of using for some of the registration. Um, so I was wondering whether you needed to sort of label it with any sort of thing for the two photon or if just the also fluorescence or sort of general background was giving you enough to, um, to, to get enough of an image to um, use as a reference. Yeah, good question. Hi, then. So yes, we use Texas Red, so for Rhodamine 101, um, because it gives us a lot of contrast. Uh, has a huge signal to noise and it can be administered intraperitoneally uh, quite easily. Um, eventually, we also used a different one, um, um, lectins, um, a lectin to TD tomato, um, that are interesting because they attach to endothelial uh, blood vessels. However, those need to be um, administered intravenously and that can add a little bit of jazz to the whole experimental workflow. So the only thing to remind with um, with uh, sulforodamine is that it has a certain window where it stains the blood vessels very well, but then it's a very small molecule. It will stain other stuff. So you need to add it at the very last point. So we will acquire the in vivo data with only um, GCAMP uh, signal coming, um, coming out of it. And then at the very end of the functional imaging step is when we label the blood vessels um, with, the, with the injection of, of uh, sulforodamine then we have the, that kind of hour, hour and a half window uh, where only blood vessels are, are labeled and we get the data set and then the experiment continues outside the microscope. Great, thanks. Thank you very much for that answer. So are there any other questions in the, uh, in the chat there? Um, I don't see. Okay, I actually I have a couple of questions. So one thing is, um, does the sort of depth penetration of the two photon imaging have any sort of consequences on, on where you go with this sort of work? Because clearly the, the tomography is, is sort of doesn't really care about the size of the sample up to a point. Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the reasons we study the olfactory bulb is because it's a cortical structure. Um, it's close to the surface of the brain. And so within the half millimeter depth, we have the entire circuit imaging deeper circuits in the brain, will you will need to get deeper. Um, right. And there's different approaches that allow for that. Um, one is adding, removing the top part of the brain. Um, so you can access the hippocampus, for instance, that's, that's one way of doing that. Another way, uh, way is adding lenses that will guide the path of light um, uh, further down. Another one is using other multi-photon techniques that might have uh, deeper penetration power, like uh, three photon uh, microscopes uh, that seem to start um, uh, providing reliably um, good signal to noise down to beyond the, uh, reaching the millimeter in depth and even slightly beyond. But yeah, you're compl completely right. Um, the, the the window you have access into photon is that one. Uh, it's, it's just one more constraint of experiment that we, yeah. one needs to take into account. I have to say, <laughs> great job with it. I mean, that, that's actually the other question, and one more question I had, I don't, don't know if I'm, if you went over this during the tour, I just missed it, was um, for sort of segmentation annotation, is this manual or is this machine sort of learning assisted work now? That's a good question as well. Uh, so machine learning is very useful when it can save you time. Uh, it can seem like a like a circular <laughs> argument, but it's not always the case. So depending on the approaches that, and in many cases, um, it's faster for us to trace things manually, especially when you explore new features, um, of particular, very particular analysis that you don't want to repeat a lot of times. In those cases, it's 
much, much faster to do it by hand. Uh, mm -hmm. Anything, I think if everything that I've presented today uh, does not contain uh, machine learning. However, we are relying. So the moment we standardize the way we acquire data sets, for instance, synchrotron data sets or other synchrotron imaging modalities we are involved with, then once we know that data and we know one particular question that we want to ask that data set, where are all the cells? Where are all the glomeruli? Where is all the tissue? Do I have to draw the tissue all the time? For those particular things that cannot be thresholded, then is when there's a very good case for developing a classifier. And I have to say that while classifiers, the problem is that we are interested in replicating experiments, um, which means that the first classifiers we will use a lot are those that transfer well between data sets. Right. Um, and that's transfer learning is something that is also tricky, but it's not impossible. And we are definitely interested in having some particular classifiers to segment particular things that we are always asking to specific, very standardized data sets. But otherwise, tracing manually is perfectly good, perfectly good and can save you a lot of time. Okay, great. Well, that's a good perspective on this problem, I must say. Um, do we have any other questions from anyone in the audience here? No, I think we are in that case. I think we should then just... Uh, uh, thank you for such a great talk and really interesting and demanding work, I have to say. That's, uh, great to see where the field is going. And um, yeah, so I'll just give you the awkward Zoom clap from me and hopefully the audience members will respond with a wavy hand or something rather to us. Thank you for such an interesting talk. All right. Yeah. Thanks you all for inviting. A pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Bye. Bye.